Good evening, friends. You may be seated. It's indeed a privilege to be here this afternoon to serve again in the name of our Lord. And just before we begin the service, I see some of my brethren sitting in the recording pit here with recorders. And Billy Paul, my son, has asked Brother Woods, a friend, if he will meet him in the front of the building just as quick as possible out in front concerning the books and pictures for the services. And to have this introduction so nicely given, and what kind of a person I'd have to live a pretty good life to live up to that, wouldn't I? But that's because Brother Matson loves me. He's my bosom friend. And so we're very happy for this privilege of being here. And I begin things in Chicago, it looks like. Of all my years of ministry, this is the first time in all my ministry that I ever had an afternoon service. And all the time of my ministry that I can remember that I ever had an, ins an instruction meeting in the afternoon. And uh, this is about nine years, I think, I have been in the services. And so I begin anew in Chicago again, Brother Joseph. <laughs> and so I know no better place to start or begin things. Well, I should just say one word, and that is that I think personally that Brother Branham belongs to Chicago. <laughs> Thank you. How brother. many think it's right? <laughs> I know it. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Joseph. Thank you, dear Christian friends. I have often thought that someday God would give us a revival in Chicago like the days of Moody, when the whole city would be moved for God. And you haven't had one since that day. And I, I believe that it's near at hand. And the only thing has been in my ministry, Christian friends, and I know these recorders are picking these things up and they'll be scattered in the papers everywhere. So I have to watch the words that I say and weigh them out because the, the, once an article is published and once your voice is called on a recorder, that's it. That's See, it. it's that. And so they pick it up in order to pick up for the people many times that's in the line. If you'll watch some people come through and say, well, now, the Lord said certain, certain things. Well, now, if we've only got the people's word, well, that's all we have. But the recorder settles it. See, when, when he said, well, when you watch what he tells you to do, watch your destination, watch what he told you in the times, what you have done, and then let, watch what he tells you in the times it's going to happen. And you find out not one time will you ever find a flaw that God, but what he'll do, just exactly what he says he'll do That's every right. time. See, he'll do it. I am 45 years old, April, and I have seen vision since the, one of the first things I can remember. It seems strange, but I remember when I was yet crawling. In my days, when baby was crawling, they had long dresses. And I remember mother had a little a ribbon worked in my dress. And I was crawling and on an old cabin floor way in the mountains of Kentucky where I was born. And I was eating snow off of some man's foot as the first thing I can remember. And the next thing I remember was God speaking to me in a vision and telling me that I'd spend a bigger part of my life near a city called New Albany. And the last 40 years I have lived within a few miles of New Albany, Indiana, which is two or three hundred miles away from the place it was. And none of our people as far as been out of the state of Kentucky, as far as I know. But always and every time, see, gifts and callings are without repentance. Those things are first given of God. Right. Them offices is set in the church by God. And my opinion, there's where so many of this day has made a mistake when... Uh, we say, now I'll go over and seek for God to make me this, that. You cannot do that, see. You are what you are by grace. Nothing that you can do within yourself. God gives. God has set in the church. Apostles, teachers, prophets. Is that right? Yes. God has set in the church right. for the perfecting. So, not the bishop has in our the elder has or someone else, but God has. Amen, yeah. And they, they are, those offices is put in the church. Now, I do know that gifts, 
such as the nine spiritual gifts, they are gifts that work in the entire church. For instance, tonight this one may prophesy and never prophesy again. Maybe the spirit of prophecy be on someone else the next night. Paul said you all may prophesy one by one. That's the gift of prophecy, not a prophet. See, there's quite a difference between gift of prophecy and a prophet. The gift of prophecy has to be judged by three good spiritual judges before the church can receive it, according to Paul's writing in Corinthians. The judges has to judge this, has to judge the interpretation of tongues before the church receives it. Because they wouldn't know what... But now you take a person that would be a prophet like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Moses. No one stood before them to judge what was right or not. They were born in this world prophets. The word of God was with them. God in sundry times and diverse manners spoke to the fathers through the prophets in this last day through his son, Jesus Christ. And he is the prophet of the church of this last day, is the, Jesus Christ. And the Bible said in, over in the book of Revelations that the spirit or the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Hey, right. And so in these things, all these great things to see the church set together. When I first seen the Pentecostal people and heard them speak with tongues, I'd been taught as a Baptist that that was of the devil. So I thought, now look at here. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, the one thing I don't care what the church says, the Bible said they shall speak with new tongues. That's right. uh, the first thing I had to either take the church or take the Bible. I said, what am I going to do? He said, let every man's word be a lie. Or it's bishop, archbishop, or whoever he is. And my word be the truth. And that's the vast difference between Catholicism and Protestantism. See, Catholicism, you can't argue with the Catholic on the Bible. Because after all, if the church says something contrary to the Bible, it's the church. They say God is in his church. The Protestant says God is in his word. See? Now there's a difference. So that you can't argue because if the church says a certain thing, ask them where they get not eat meat on Friday and all these other things. They can, well, they said the church said so. And a few days ago, I had an interview with a priest. The priest said, I was asking some questions as my people before me were Catholic. And I said, uh, I want to ask you some questions uh, scripturally. And um, uh, he said, just a minute, Mr. Branham. <laughs> he said, see, we Catholics go to church and worship. You Protestants stay home and read the Bible. But we go to church and worship. I said, but what? That's the next thing. <laughs> what? Now, he said, see, we don't notice what, what the Bible says is all right. But if the church says contrary, then the church is right. Because Peter was the Pope and the Pope succeeds Peter and whatever the church is set together, that is the order. That's what it goes. God still moved well. I said, of course, it's all right. Every fellow, that's what makes us America. Every fellow to his own belief. But I believe that whatever God has said, God's word does not alter. God's word does not change. One jot or tittle will in no wise pass from it till every bit of it's fulfilled. And I believe that Paul said, if an angel from heaven would come and teach any other thing than what you had already been taught in this scripture, let him be unto you a curse. Galatians 1.8. So I am a fundamental believer in the Bible. What the Bible says, I believe it. And I believe it's the truth and ready to hang my soul on any phase of the Bible or any any sentence, comma, whatever it might be, that God's Word is everlasting truth. It's inspired and written, and we stay with it. In the Old Testament, there was three ways that they could get a message. That was by a prophet, or by a dreamer, or by the law. And now... If a prophet prophesied, and on the breast of Aaron, Aaron was the Ur Methundum. And if the lights flashed on the Ur Methundum, that prophet was telling the truth. But if the lights didn't flash on that Ur Methundum, then it was wrong. If a dreamer d- dreamed a dream and told that dream, and, and it didn't flash on the Ur Methundum, it was wrong. The prophet, if he prophesied and the lights didn't flash, he was wrong. And the Urim of Thundum from that priesthood was taken away. But here is the Urim of Thundum of the priesthood today. Yes. The Word of God. 
if a dreamer or a prophet or a preacher or anything teaches contrary to this Bible, it's wrong. That's right. Let him be accursed. Right. But it must be built solidly upon this word, as thus saith the Lord. Right. And if this word is correctly set in order and taught by the minister, God's solemnly under obligation to his son yes. to answer that word and fulfill it. Now, that's the way I believe the Bible. I believe every word of it. Now, there may be times that I may not be able to set it together. I don't believe there's any mortal in the world can correctly set every word together. But we only can as the Holy Spirit inspires us to do. Many times it's contrary to her teaching. My wife happened to be standing outside last night. Just as soon as the, she said two or three passed the platform, said a group of people got up and walked out. Said one of them looked over to the other and said, what do you think about it? I said, oh, punk, there's nothing to that. And um, another one walked out in a few minutes and said, well, it was a pretty good show, wasn't it? <laughs> Not to have to pay to get in. <laughs> and that's the opinion of the starchy people of this world. Yeah. See, that's their opinion. It's always been their opinion. It was their opinion. Their fathers had the same opinion and is in hell today. That's right. And remember, what if this would have been the truth they was listening at last night? Then they have blasphemed the Holy Ghost, That's which is right. never forgiveness in this world or the world to come. Is that right? Yes. That's right. It's best to keep still if you're not sure. So, the Lord bless you. Now this afternoon, as we've gathered here for one purpose, that's to instruct for healing services tonight. On the return back from overseas, God willing, I want to start my services different. I was just speaking to one of the managers just a few moments ago, our dear brother Moore, and I was telling him what God is placing on my heart, to come to a place like Chicago or somewhere and not just run away, just have to come in for a few nights and, and get, you weakens me down in such a way they got to take me out. But come there where I'll just bring the prayer line up. And just keep praying for the people one after the other until the Holy Spirit takes a hold of that gift to operate itself. You see, in the way of a sinner, something passed over the platform without repenting, it would call his attention. See, but this way, by this divine gift and his presence, just a few times and I'm about finished. It just makes me so weak I can't get out of the building hardly. Sometimes do pass completely out under it. And one time was out eight months and better. So... Uh, you remember that time, many of you. But on returning, God willing, as I say this, recordings are being made, I am going to try to set up a, a meetings for a year after returning and come to a place like Chicago and just stay right there in Chicago, wherever it may be, until Christ says, now I want you to go somewhere else. That's right. And then yeah. in that... That's right. Don't have every night, just uh, every time. Just bring my, preach the gospel, make altar calls, get people saved, fill with the Holy Spirit, and then have my line pray for the sick after that's over. Yes. And give out prayer cards, and then everywhere it leaves off this night, the next night start from the same one like that, and then you'll be, you have plenty of time this way. We can't do that because we're only here a few nights, and we got to catch just what comes in. That way, every person, if they're there and seen their prayer cards way back, they can wait four or five nights and come back again to the meeting or a week or two or whatever it would be, you see. And we could catch everybody that way. And that's my vision for when I come back from overseas. And we hope that God is in it and to help us and have a great meeting in America. I think for almost nine years now, I've been operating this way when the Lord has confirmed that the, it's truth and over and over and over and over and over again, we see it back and forth, back and forth. And so I think now the time is to preach the gospel. Amen. I'm not much of a preacher. I don't study on what I'm going to talk about. I just preach by inspiration. I just look around until I find it and reach out and get it and hand it out. Sometimes it's pretty rough, but that's the way I get it. It's rough. <laughs> so I just like to have it that way. Because after all, who are we? We're not a bunch of aristocratic, uh, starch-necked people. We're a Pentecostal people that's been born again and filled with the Holy Ghost. Our fathers was born under this inspiration. They were born illiterate preachers. Our fathers, who was that? Peter, James, and John. Yeah. That's right. When they went up through the gate called Beautiful, healed a man sitting there. It was crippled in his mother's womb. 
Well, they was poor people. He said, silver and gold have I none. And then the people had to take notice that they were ignorant and unlearned people, but they had been with Jesus. That's one thing they know. So that's what we are. That's the kind of people we are. Now the Lord bless you. And when we go into the instructions now, and if Brother Joseph, you let me know what time it gets along here. So uh, what time do you usually close these kind of services? Well, it's not in a hurry. It's uh, 3.30 now. About 4 o'clock? No, four fifteen. All right, that'll be or fine. Or four thirty. All right, that'll be fine. I didn't. Um, can you all hear Brother Branham well? Can you hear all right out there, back in the back? That's fine. That fine. That's thank, thank you. you. Now, before we open this book, there's no man can open this book. I might turn the pages back and say we'll read a chapter from here, but God is the only one can open this book. Do you remember in the heaven the book was laying sealed? with seven seals on the back side. You remember that? Yes. <laughs> and did you ever think that we have come through Luther's justification, through Wesley's sanctification, through Pentecostal Holy Ghost, and still we're kind of muddling along? There's something else to be revealed. It's not written in here. It's in the seals. Right. We go teach on those things, the Lord willing, when I come back. Remember Daniel heard those seven voices uttered their voices and he started writing he said don't don't write it see it'll be revealed in the last days is that right John saw the same thing and when he saw it on there this book on the back side after it's done been taught all the way through on the back side had seven seals and these was to be loosened when the mystery of God would be fulfilled we're at that time for the seven mysteries to be opened up to the church Oh, what rich teaching this Bible produces. Yeah. But no one, no one was able to even take the books, look thereon, or to loose the seals. And there was a lamb that had been slain from the foundation of the world. Come tuck the hand out of the, the book out of the hand of him and set up on the throne and open the book and loose the seals thereon. Amen. So let us speak to him who can do this now while we bow our heads. Our dear, loving, heavenly Father, we approach thee today humbly. In the name of thy dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank thee that he was ever mindful of us to include us back there before the foundation of the world. That we would be holy and without blame in his presence at that day. Then where could we brag? Nothing we've done, nothing we can do. But by grace are we saved through faith. For before the foundation of the world... He chose us in Christ Jesus. And now he's given us the Holy Spirit, a seal until the day of our redemption when we shall be presented to the Father faultless standing washed in his blood. And now may he that taken the book from the right hand come and take the book this afternoon and open it to us as we speak on it. Father, I pray that you'll give instructions to these poor, sick, needy people. Many's drove several miles to come here to be prayed for. And I ask thee, Father, to give spirit to thy servant and knowledge, not for self, but for these poor, sick, needy people that's sitting in this auditorium today. And may you give them such instructions that they'll know perfectly how to take a hold and how to believe thy promises and how to defeat the enemy which is given to us uh, this word of defeat right here in the Bible and we pray that you'll help us today to explain it to your children and get glory out of the services for we ask that in his lovely name Jesus Christ our Lord Amen, Amen. As a little scripture reading, I want to read out of the Psalms, the Psalms 103, 1 to 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgiveth all of thine iniquity, who healeth all of thy diseases. And by closing the book, I say this scripture is fulfilled this day in your presence. The Lord to be blessed because he forgives all of our iniquity, 
and heals all of our diseases today. The Word is made manifest today. How that God has made a provision, and I would speak it in this way, God's provided way of healing. So many people seek healing in the wrong attitude, the wrong motive of coming. The first thing a Christian should do, or any person's coming to healing, should be sure that their heart is pure and clean before God. And then, if this sickness still remains, then you should have help from somewhere. Now, I'm going to say something that I have never said publicly in my ministry, but being it just come to my mind then, I want to speak it. And I have shunned it. But on these afternoons, as I see this afternoon, there's just a little handful of us sitting here. And let's just... As it were, take off our coats now and get right down to talk heart to heart to each other. Now, I have very much been perplexed that people are saying that all oh, the healers, uh, of the, these divine healers, and frankly, that's what they are. Yes. That's exactly what they are, biblical terms. They are divine healers. Just as much as they are preachers, just as much as they are was apostles, and anything else, it's a divine gift given to a person to minister. Amen. Now, we would like to place, say, well, like preaching. Well, let John Doe or anybody preach. If John Doe wasn't absolutely called of God to be a preacher, he'll never make a successful preacher. That's right. His mother might have told him he should be a preacher and his dad might have sent him off to a seminary and he might have all the degrees and so forth, but he'll never be able to lead people to God till the Holy Spirit has moved into that man's life and give him something that he may not be able to speak his words right. He may not have the right uh, uh, grammar. He might not be able to uh, use the right psychology. But if he's got the power of God in his life, the people will know it. That's right. God will be with him. Well, the same thing. John Doe might be an educated man with psychology and everything else, but he can't produce the message of that poor illiterate fellow that's called by the Lord. Now, we know that. You just might as well admit it because our greatest ministers has been, has been men of that type. For instance, the last revival in Chicago was by a great revival, was by Dwight Moody, who was a very much of an unlearned man. His right. grammar was so poor, it was awful. <laughs> Nothing but a little old shoe cobbler. Oh, you read his books, but yes, them were written by someone else. And his sermons polished up a whole lot. Dwight Moody was an unlearned man. And Peter, one of the greatest speakers of all the times outside of Jesus Christ, one of the greatest writers, wouldn't even know his own name if it was written before him. John, ignorant and unlearned, and so forth like that. But they had been with Jesus Christ, and they had a message that had power. Peter, quoting Joel a few times, won 3,000 souls to Jesus Christ at one time. Think of that. Ignorant, unlearned. So you don't have to go to great educations and extremes of those things. What you have to do is know Jesus and Christ giving you the ability by the Holy Spirit to do such. Now, divine healing is on the same basis. There are some people who can actually believe in divine healing and pray for divine healing, but never be able to touch divine healing because they just can't do it. It's not given to them. Now, there's such a... I notice the people on a platform, many times before the Spirit catches me away to the anointing so great to, they have to leave me out. Now... When I'm looking at the person, some of them come, and there's many times that I see things I don't say nothing about. I try to just say enough to get the people's faith I see I've caught their attention like that, and then pray for them in order to get a hold of another. More you talk, well, more it would come, just constantly. Just, you're just in that channel, man, and it just keeps rolling down. And so then, in teaching divine healing, and uh, seeing people come, they say, Oh, yes, brother, I have faith. Now, they imagine they have faith. See? They don't have faith. Faith is just as positive as your eyesight or my feelings to know this desk is here. 
You don't have to be educated. Frankly, it'd be good if you're just a little more simple about it than what you really are. That's right. Just you. Just It's just something that you know it's going to be. That's all. It's just a positive. Why there couldn't be nothing move it out of your way, you know it's going to happen. You just nothing can take it out. If a doctor would stand and say, you're going to die the next hour and you knew that you was going to get well, he might tell you you had uh, covered all over with cancer and leprosy eating through you. That wouldn't scare you one bit. No, sir. Now, that's faith. Look at when Paul was shipwrecked out there. Well, he'd lost hopes too. All hopes they could be saved, Paul said, was gone. The little old ship was waterlogged and 14 days and nights, no moon, stars or nothing. A little boat tossed about in the waters and everything. And Paul said, well, I guess all hope's gone. So he didn't know. But standing down in the gallery that night, praying a vision come before him. And he saw the angel of the Lord come. He said, don't fear, Paul, for you're going to be brought before Caesar. That's right. And lo, God give all these that sail with you, is give them to you. So therefore you be of a good courage. And you go on out and have a good courage. And little old Paul, right in the middle of the storm, run on the outside, shaking his hands and screaming, top of his voice, saying, Be of a good courage, brother. For there stood the angel of God before me last night, said, Not to be scared. We're just going to come right on in before Caesar. So yeah. now I'll tell you, there's not one of you going to die. Not one pair of your head's going to perish. But we're going, the ship's going to be wrecked somewhere in the vision. I've seen it sitting on a shore wreck somewhere. But there's nothing going to harm us. So let's take something and eat. And they, all, they was afraid to do it. And Paul went and got the sandwich and made it and started eating. Why? Well, he wasn't scared. Why? God done said so. Anchored in Paul's heart. Yes. I don't care the ship was a pitching just as hard as it could. No stars, no moon. Days passed on by. Didn't worry Paul a bit. I imagine one sandwich after the other walking up and down the deck saying, Glory to God. We're not far from land, brothers. There you are. No matter how dark it got, the whale might have come up to turn the ship over. The sharks following by the hundreds. That wouldn't faze Paul. No, sir. He knew what God had said. He believed what God had said. He said, wherefore, brethren, be of a good courage, for I believe God that will be just as he showed it to me. There's faith. Got out on the aisle out there, and he picked up a bunch of sticks to throw on the fire. And the heat got in the sticks, and a big old snake that, when it bit you, only lived just a couple of seconds after it hit you. Must have been a, like the African mumba. I think you live about two or three minutes after one bites you. about as long as you can live. Serum and no serum. And it grabbed him on the hand. Paul looked at it and said, The Lord said, I must be brought before Caesar. <laughs> well, you couldn't hurt me. Shuck him off the fire and went over and got some more sticks and turned around and got warm. As if nothing had ever happened. Amen. See what I mean? God told Paul, You're going to be brought before Caesar. And Paul hadn't yet been brought before Caesar, so nothing fazed Paul. He knew he was going on. Now, that's faith. You got your course set. You know exactly where you're standing. Now, when an individual can pray to you, strike that place, brother, there is enough doctors in Chicago to tell you he's going to remain sick. That's right. I uh, was looking around to find a crippled person. I don't I believe there's a crutch setting here, some crippled lady, perhaps. If the Holy Spirit would reveal to you just now, sister, that you're going out of here this afternoon to throw that crutch out here in the middle of the street <laughs> and walk down home not using it anymore, and it would be so directly delivered to you, you'd probably kiss the old crutch goodbye before you even raised up from there. You'd just turn around to people and say, maybe I haven't walked for so and so and so much, but watch me go out of here, see? you know it. There's nothing could stop it. If the Holy Spirit would speak to me now and say, that woman, I'd see her by vision going and walking out of that door, I would be a bit more afraid to say, but if there's a hundred million people here, that woman has been crippled for so long, or she might, I, uh, I don't know what was wrong with her. Whatever it is, she's going out of here, I'd say, without that walking stick or that crutch she's got under her arm, she's going out normally, and you'd see it happen that way. While there would be no fear, none, whatever, you see. That's faith. But now when you come say, oh, I believe God's a healer. You see, there's two men living in you. Did you know that? One time we had an Indian converted in the meeting and asked him how he was getting along after he'd received the Holy Ghost. He said, well, he said, he's been two dogs in me. <laughs> he said, one of them is an evil dog and one of them is a good dog. 
and said, they just fuss and fight all the time. <laughs> and he said, well, she said, which one overcome? She said, well, it depends on which one she feeds the most. <laughs> Well, that's not giving any comparison to the devil and the Holy Spirit comparing his dogs. But look, there is good in you and there's evil in you. And there's belief and unbelief. It depends on which one you feed the most. That's all. Which one you feed the most. Now, in you up here, every person here this afternoon, I would want to believe, believes in divine healing. Every one of you. You say, sure, Brother Branham, I believe in divine healing. Now, maybe you mean that with all the intelligence you know how to speak it. You believe it. That's in your head. But remember, there's a subconscious down there that's got to say the same thing. If it doesn't, you'll never get nowhere. That's right. You might read the Bible say, well, here, Brother Branham, the Bible says this. That's true. That's exactly right. There's where people say today, well, uh, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I'm saved. How do you know he's the Son of God? The Bible said so. See? Now I say, well, how do you know he's the Son of God? Mother said so. The preacher said so. Well, they're right. But how do you know? The Bible said that you cannot know it until you have received the Holy Ghost. You're only taking somebody else's word. Did you know that? That didn't go very good. That's right. But that's the truth. Quote it. No man can say Jesus is the Christ only by the Holy Ghost. Is that right? The Holy Ghost in you has to bear record to the resurrection and Jesus being the Son of God. Or you're only taking somebody else's word for it. You're only taking what the Bible says. The Bible's right. Or you're only taking what the minister says. The minister's right. Or what other, some other good person said. They're right. But you as an individual doesn't know Jesus is the Christ until the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. That's right. has brought it to you. That's, That's, That's right. right. Now, notice, and no man can have faith for healing until it's revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he's going to get well. Yes. You might stumble at it. That's right. You might go through life living a, a good Christian life. You might belong to some church. You might have a fine membership. You might be a moral character and all of that. But brother, that still isn't Christianity. That's right. yes. Christianity is when the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. has taken full possession of you mm -hmm. and you are led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. No matter how good, how moral, how good a church member, Cain was just as good as any church member. So was Esau, fine, cultured gentleman. So was Cain, very religious, believed in God, made sacrifice, built a church, altar, made, done all the things that's religious, and God refused him. Yes. No man can say Jesus is the Christ only by the Holy Ghost. Peter had been justified and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He'd even preached the gospel, but Jesus told him, after you are converted, then strengthen your brother. Yes. After you are converted, conversion is the Holy Spirit that moves the old nature out and the new nature comes in, which is the Holy Ghost. And when a man has truly been born of the Spirit of God, he has everlasting life. Jesus said so. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me, no man can say it except by the Holy Ghost. He that heareth my words, believeth on him, and sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation or judgment, but has passed from death unto life. That's right. That's what he said. That's right. I believe him, don't you? Amen. So, someone said not long ago, said, Brother Branham, I believe that we have the Holy Ghost. I believe that, that I am saved, and so forth. Well, how can you believe Unless you have the Holy Spirit, yeah. you can't correctly believe. Now, there's the flaw. There's the thing that the Christian don't climb over. There's the thing the sick person don't climb over. See? There's a vast difference in looking at God's Word and receiving God's Word. When you, them that receive the Word, yes. not them that examined it, but them that received it, yes. God added to the church. Such as be saved. 
3,000 souls received the word. Now you can hear the word preached. You can look at it and admit that it's right. Cain did, all the others did. But just where the word fell, brought forth them that received it. Gladly was bad times, see. Receiving the word. Now, when you receive the inspiration that Jesus Christ died for your sickness, it's that very hour that your healing has come. That's right. When you receive from heaven that Jesus died for your sins and you have accepted it, you don't need any prayer for you then. You've already accepted it. It's settled. Now we can preach the word, explain the word, but you have to receive the word. Oh, hallelujah. That's what sets it afire, brother. When you receive it, the revelation, something slips out of the unseen world yonder, comes rolling down through a mystical uh, channel somewhere into your soul. It says, now I see it. Your eyes brighten. Your lips are hung down, straighten up and smile. Every muscle in your body seems to rejoice. Something's going to happen. Something. You don't need to be in a prayer line then. You've got it then. Now, that's where if everybody in this building at this time would get in that kind of an attitude, every person would be perfectly healed. Now, how do we get people that way? Some can receive it, some cannot receive it. But those who can receive it, they look at it and accept it, believe it. Others may be another meaning. Now, that's one way of preaching it by the word. Another way is to maybe somebody speak with tongues and they give an interpretation and, and reveal the secrets of their heart. Or maybe there be someone with a prophet would stand and do something in the supernatural that you'd look up and say, oh, there it is. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Then something happens to you. But you sit there saying, hmm, that's mental telepathy. Oh, I know Dr. Jones said so. Uh, brother, you're in a dangerous place. You're in a terrible place. You might say it's all punk and so forth like that. But you'll answer it the day of judgment for it. That's right. And remember, when God is making His revelation, revealing Himself to His people, that's the benefit of the meetings. That's what God gave the gifts for, was to magnify Him and to unify the people and to bring the body together and to help us to unite our efforts and our prayers. A person sitting in a group of people like this, where faith is gathered on every side, it'll help you to get well. There'll be people who listen at the word being taught that'll never be in a prayer line, yet they'll get well. For something happens subconsciously, maybe, that they don't even realize what it's about. They'll get well. Somebody is sitting and watch one of the signs of the Lord appear, and they'll get well. See, it's when faith, anything that can stimulate that faith. Now, I can look at wheat here laying on my hand. I recognize it's wheat. I can say that it's wheat. I can show it to the ground. And if the ground can look, it say, yeah, that's wheat. I believe it's wheat, every word of it. But that wheat can never produce wheat until this wheat falls into the ground and dies itself. Is that right? That's the man looking fundamentally saying, yes, I believe healing. I believe it's right. I believe it's the Word of God. I believe it's for the believer. And I believe that I got faith to receive it. But until you receive it, yes. get what I mean? Yes. Then when you receive it, you rejoice. Yes. The Word's in there. It's settled. All doubts is dead. All the husk is dropped off. And new life has sprung up growing into healing for yourself. Yes. That's when you really get your healing. That's where healing comes from. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing of the Word. Now, faith is not healing. Faith produces healing. See? By faith are you saved. Now look, if here was a loaf of bread that cost a quarter, I believe that's about the price of it, and I had 25 cents. Now 25 cents is the purchasing price of the bread, but I've got the 25 cents, but haven't got the bread. Now you can have faith for healing, and I believe many of you have, but you can't receive healing until you purchase healing by that faith that you have. Yes. You say, oh, Brother Branham, I wish I had the Holy Ghost. I got faith that I'll get it. 
Well, then you swap your faith for the Holy Ghost. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's all you have to do. When you got that faith, nothing can take it away from you. Now, if you're just making belief, you're, if you're impersonating, if you're putting on, it won't work for you. But if it's real faith, it's, it's over. Yeah. God will do it right then. You believe that? Yeah. And when you say, oh, yes, Brother Branham, I believe in divine healing. Well, all right, if you believe in divine healing, then take that same faith that you got in divine healing and purchase your healing. Yes. See? And you receive it by the faith. Sure. Someone said, we're talking about receiving the Holy Ghost. Of course, being raised up and uh, nurtured in my young days of my ministry in a Baptist church and teaching that you receive the Holy Ghost when you believe according to the Baptist church. But according to the Bible, you receive the Holy Ghost after you believe. Yes. After you believe. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, accept Him as your personal Savior, and then receive the Holy Ghost. And until you have received the Holy Ghost, God has never recognized your faith. That's right. Abraham, the father of faith, believed God in a case of healing and salvation. Through the healing brought salvation because it brought Isaac and through Isaac comes salvation. Now, notice that Abraham believed God. Was that right? Yes. And it was imputed to him for righteousness and God gave him a sign that he had received his faith. Amen. Do you get it? Yes. Look, see, Abraham said, Lord, I believe you. No voice come back. I don't know. <laughs> he said, Lord, I believe you. And no voice come back. Abraham didn't know. But God spoke back and gave Abraham a sign that he had received his faith. He gave him circumcision as a sign. Is that right? Yeah. In other words, it was a confirmation of Abraham's faith. Then when he got the confirmation, he said, praise God, it's finished. Yeah. <laughs> he said, I got faith and God recognized it. Yeah. When you say, I got faith and God gives you the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it's a confirmation Amen. that God has received your faith. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. What well, you say is, is the Holy Ghost circumcision? Yes, sir and ma'am. It is right. The Holy Ghost is the seal of the living God. That's right. Man. It is the seal of God's approval of your faith. For Ephesians 4.30 said, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, yes. whereby you are sealed yes. until the day of your redemption. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Now, when you say you've got faith for divine healing and something strikes you and says, move out, that's the confirmation that God has received your faith for divine healing. Yes. That's right. Yes. When you've got courage to put your faith in action. But when you say you've got faith and afraid to let it go, your faith is dead. See? But when you've got faith and willing to let it go, then God's confirming it with the signs following, and you'll see your healing. Yes. That's true. When you've got faith. Now, these meetings and people gathering, that's what it's for, is to encourage faith, to bring faith up. We couldn't heal, certainly not. But we have a part in doing it. That's preaching the gospel. That's one part in doing it. Another part would be speaking with tongues. That's an part if it's by revelation. And a gift of prophecy, that's another. Uh, uh, that. Then uh, signs and wonders and Everything is gifts and everything in the church to stimulate the church, to keep the church together for every attribute of Jesus' life until he returns again in glory. Amen. 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 Now, your enemy is the devil. And God has in every way, in every age, always tried to keep people well. Do you believe that? Yes. God has never left the people any time without a provided way of healing. That's it. You name it in the scriptures when he did. No matter how blacked out, how far away the people got, God had a provided way of healing. That's He's always had it. He's always had someone who believed it too. Right. Look, way back in the early days, he had a provided way. Then he had a brass serpent. That was God's provided way for the children of Israel. From back, coming out of the land of Egypt. When they started their march, he knew there would be sickness. 
So he just uh, said, well, he provided a way. I was preaching here some time ago somewhere on the Moses was a doctor, Dr. Moses. I don't know whether you believe it or not, but he was a doctor. The Bible said he was taught in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Is that right? Yes. So they were boasting physicians. Oh, my. And so Dr. Moses. And I'd imagine a lot of medics here of, of Chicago would like to know how Moses kept two million people healthy and strong for 40 years and marched them out of the wilderness without a feeble one among them. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I'd like to have some of those remedies he had, wouldn't you? I wonder how many fig poluses and things he used back there. How many herbs and penicillin shots he had. See, back Dr. Moses. He had two million people that he brought out of Egypt, approximately, and brought them out of Egypt, take them over to Palestine. And in there, how many babies would be born in one night? Dr. Moses had them do the visiting. How many people got the stomach ache and through the, the day eating what they could find along the road? How many calls would Dr. Moses have to make every night? <laughs> Did you ever think of that? And how many people over them rocks and things fell and skint their legs and maybe broke a leg or something like that every day? Because they were murmuring and backsliding and everything else, so they got in trouble. And Dr. Moses... Would you like to look at his medicine chest and see what all he had? The Bible gives it. Did you know the Bible gives every speck of medicine Moses had with him? Did you know that? I'll show it to you in just a moment. I will just go look over here in his medicine chest and see what Moses had now. Exodus. Let's look. Here it is. It opens up. I am the Lord thy God that healeth thee. (laughs) That's every prescription he had. So when somebody says the baby was going to be born, the mother was in trouble, I'm the Lord thy God that healeth thee. If they had a man would something would happen, put one of his eyes out, I'm the Lord thy God that healeth thee. Yes. And when a man fell and broke his leg, I'm the Lord thy God that healeth thee. If one of the children had pneumonia, I'm the Lord thy God that healeth thee. Dr. Moses, what do you got on the menu tonight? What's on the, the way tonight? What's on the, the charter tonight? We got a sick baby down here. Moses said, I'm the Lord thy God that healeth thee. Thank you, Dr. Moses. We'll go use it. Lord, you said you're the Lord thy God that healeth the baby. Amen. We believe you, Lord. The next morning the baby was playing. Yes. That's it. I'm the Lord that healeth thee. The only prescription Moses had and brought two million people through the wilderness 40 years and there wasn't a feeble or a cripple or a blind to come out of the wilderness with them. Hallelujah. Oh. Excuse me, uh, that just had to blow out. That's all. It'd been holding back there for about a half hour. All right. I'm the Lord that healeth thee. That's the only prescription they know. And that worked very good. Give me a doctor today that'll keep two million people well for 40 years. He'll certainly have some practice. <laughs> He'll make himself a reputation. Well, I'll tell you the same prescription that Moses used is open to every person in the world today. Hey, Amen. Whosoever will, let him come and drink from the waters of the uh, waters of life freely. Whosoever will, let him come. Amen. Now that's where we're getting down to home line. Now I feel religious now. Mine. That's the prescription. That's the one we're trying to introduce to the world today. If you can believe, Jesus said, "I can." If you can. Lord, have mercy on me, said the blind man. Does thou believe that I can do this? Yea, Lord, we believe. I can if you believe that I can. He touched their eyes. That's what they want his hands laid on. So now according to your faith, be it unto you. And they had what they said they had. Their eyes come open and they glorified God. There it was. One day he was sitting in the house teaching and the first thing you know, stuff began to fall around on the floor. I can imagine seeing him looking. Wonder what's climbing up there. In a few minutes, something else began to fall. Just taking the roof off the house. They had some fellow there that's going to bring him over to get him before the Lord. And now this fellow that come might not have had very much faith. So they let him down. Jesus looking at the man, know that he had sinned and done wrong. But perceiving their faith, he believed their faith. <laughs> 
Hallelujah. He looked at the man, knowing the thoughts of his heart. He said, your sins is forgiven yeah. you now. Get up and go on. <laughs> Hallelujah! That's the thing we're needing in Chicago and everywhere else today. The revelation of the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that through speaking His Word has life. Jesus coming by the tree one day, looked up on the tree and said, No fruit grow on you. No man eat from you from henceforth. One on up, nothing happened. The next day they was coming back about 11 o'clock. They'd run him out up there at the temple. The Pharisees and Sadducees and mocking and making fun of him. He passed on by. And Peter, you know, always walking along, you know, looking at everything. He looked around and that tree began to wither. He said, Lord, look at there. That tree that thou did curse yesterday, it's already withered. Jesus turned and said, have faith in God. For what's... Whatever things you desire, when you pray, believe you receive it, and you shall have it. Is that right? When you pray, believe you receive it. Now, what happened to that tree? Jesus, how many knows that a tree has a germ of life? Everybody does. If it didn't, it wouldn't live. Now, there was, now watch, the tree died from where? The roots. The Bible said it was withered from the roots. Now, in the root was the tree's life. Jesus didn't speak to the leaves, neither did he speak to the branches. He never spoke to the roots, but he spoke to the life. And the life left the tree. The tree was left standing without life. It was withering. Is that right? Now, would it be any harder for Jesus to speak to a cancer than it would be the tree? Is that right? Speak to a tumor, cataract? Any other germ? Any other life? He said, No man eateth from thee from henceforth. And the tree began to wither the next day. It didn't have any life. If he'd say, Bother this man no more. And he said, When you say, not me, not what I say, what you say, believe that it'll come to pass. And the life will leave it. What is a cancer? What is, a, what is a disease? We'll deal on that for the next five minutes now. What is a cancer? What caused that thing? Let's take a cancer. Or anything you wish to take. Tuberculosis, pneumonia, whatever. You wish you any disease. Diseases are germs. Let me pass something here quickly as our times are going. Listen, did you know the Bible predicts that in the last days... That there'll be a germ warfare. That diseases will break out upon the people. And will fall on everyone without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But was the angel who had charge over these plagues. Was given orders to touch no one on whom the mark was. How much kind of a teachers have we got to be brethren. To get the church in order to be in that condition. Immune. My arms are sore now from where the doctors has punched needles in to try to inoculate me from yellow fever and so forth. I told them I didn't need it, but they wouldn't listen to me. But i tell you what God's going to do. God's got a serum. And it's called the Holy Ghost. And when that serum goes in, it'll inoculate you. Hallelujah. In the last days. I remember one time during the 37 flood, everybody had to take typhoid shots. And so I was escaping mine. I was a lineman, so I was out and gone. Some fellow walked up to me and said, have you got your shots yet? I said, oh, yes. I got my shot. He said, uh, you did? said, did it make you sick? I said, oh, no. I said, no, it sure didn't. He said, when did you get your shot? I said, oh, about three years ago. Three years? He said, well, you ought to take another. And I said, I get one about every hour, brother. (laughs) All right. I was just going on to him. But look, friend, the time is coming that when there is rising up a church, if we can't have faith for divine healing, how are we going to have faith for the rapture? 
We've got to move out, friends. We've got to get out of this old slow church condition that we're in. Step out, launch out, cut the shorelines. And get out into somewhere where you lose all senses of fear and doubt. Out there where all things are possible. Rather, just as free as it can be. You got your sails set towards heaven and nothing can stir you no way. You're gone that way, that's all. Nothing can harm you. Now, that's the kind of a church that's going to be one of these days according to the Bible. For the angel poured out his wrath and diseases broke out and man even rotted in their flesh where they were standing. And the fowls air come down and eat off of the shoulders and eat the flesh of chief captains and great mans and presidents and warriors and diplomats and potentates and everything. Eat. But the angel was given charge, don't you come near anyone that's got the seal of God in their forehead. It's going to be a book. One of these days, divine healing is going to be a great thing (laughs) among the people. So let's get in condition. God wants us. You say, well, Brother Bram, you say, let us. That's what God's waiting on. God, we're waiting on Jesus to return and Jesus waiting on us. You say, well, how, what can we do about it? The Bible said the hour has come and his bride has made herself ready. That's right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Made herself ready. Diseases, cancer, growths. What are they? We'll take, for instance, here stands a young lady. Looked like in the very best of health. Strong, healthy looking and maybe in a few weeks, we begin to notice her health failing. Well, they wonder what. They'll, they'll go to a doctor, maybe. And the doctor will look her over. you say, well, first thing you would check her blood or something other, or give her an examination and find out there's a cancer. Now, for 18 or 20 years, she was in perfect health. But in her comes another growth, an, a growth. Before, if it's a growing, it's a life. Now, here's what diseases are. Listen close. Some of them don't take body form. Some goes otherwise. It's like there's a demon of that, and there's this one of epilepsy, and these different ones. Some of them takes on body form. Now, notice. There was one time when you wasn't nothing or anywhere. But there will never be a time but what you'll be something or somewhere. Now, if you'll notice this just a moment. Now... When you first started out in this world, you were just about the size, well, you were smaller than anything the human eye can see. And that was a germ coming from the male, the father. The mother is the incubator. In there come this little germ. And the first thing happened after that little germ taken its position in the womb, then a cell in this little teeny cell swelled and it popped a little place out like a little swole place and a thread, a germ of life. I've noticed it through glasses, through doctor friends. It looks like a little thread like, a little fuzz, a little hair of a thing. So teeny. But in there then comes out a little, one little gland out of this gland begins to swell. And then another swells on top of that. And another one on top of that starts in the spine. And it moves out the last is a navel card. Notice, then as it begins to feed through this card. Now, first it's about the size of a grape. Then it came about a lemon. Then an orange. Then begin to take on farm. And at nine months, the baby is born. It keeps on multiplying cells. And it comes on and nothing interrupts it. Because maybe it's a man 170 or 80 pounds, 200 pounds, or a woman, so forth, whatever is determined by the Lord. And there's that baby, and let's take it down now again. Let's take it down cell by cell. The arm comes off, the head comes off, the body comes off, on down until it's one little cell. Yes. That's where it started from. Then that little cell drops down to a germ. Yes. Well, what is that one germ? That one germ is a teeny little visible cell, the smallest of all cells. Yes. Now, what's beyond that yes. is spirit, life. The life is in itself supernatural as it comes out of the, out of the supernatural and the cosmetics and the 
so forth, and the petroleums that make up the body swells and produces itself moving out. But the first thing is a life. That's right. Now let's think about a cancer. What is a cancer then? A cancer is another life. How many knows that's true? That's right. Tumor, cataract, any of those things. Are, germs are another life. Now here comes in you somewhere another little life. Usually a cancer comes from a bruise. And all the things of the natural type the spiritual. Such as in the natural birth. Now, there's, I don't see people here but what's old enough to understand this. And I, I got a mixed congregation. This would be a doctor's talk and I'm your brother. So listen. In the life, the first thing in a baby when it's born to natural birth, the first thing is water. Is that right? Blood. Then spirit. It's got twitching of muscles, but not till it's born as it lies. Now notice, but I mean breathing life. You know what I mean. Now look, so is it in the spiritual birth. The first thing, the things that come out of Jesus' body, what the elements that came from his body is what makes up the spiritual body. When Jesus died, what came from it? What did come out of his body? Water, blood. And spirit. Is that right? right? Now, that's the things that makes up the supernatural birth. The, when a man is born again, he has three elements that he has to go through. Water, blood, spirit. That's right. Justification by faith, believing on the Lord. Sanctification, that life being cleansed up. And the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Yes. Not three works of grace, one grace. Notice, justification by faith, sanctification through the blood, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When a baby is born, water, blood, and spirit. When a baby is born, newborn baby in heaven, he comes through water, blood, and spirit. The natural types of spiritual, everything on the earth. That was my first Bible, to watch nature. You get nature typed up with God and you find out you got the same thing. Notice, in here. Now, we see where you come from. Your father and mother was married through a holy union, promised God that they'd live together and so forth, and through holy wedlock, and then by the Poland brought forth children, go multiply and replenish the earth with God's plan, and that's where you come from. But now here you are growing up, and here's another life comes into you called cancer. Now, where'd he come from? He wasn't there in the beginning. But here he is there now. Now what happens? Now a cancer in the natural realms would be a scavenger, buzzard, eats dead things. A cancer comes from a bruise. A bruised cell, use this where it comes from. The cell is bruised, all mashed up. And that is otherwise the cell is backslidden. If something happens in there that fails to get the function of blood to it right. And through there, Satan... The author of death, which God is the author of life, Satan, the author of death, puts a demon in there called a devil, demon, called cancer. Cancer is not its name. Medical science, just give it a cancer. The word cancer comes the word crab. And then it means with legs and things, it runs out. And like other diseases, they're given medical terms. Then that little cancer comes in there first. It is a spirit. Then it gets into a backslidden cell or a bruised cell or a cell that's not operating right. Oh, I'd like to preach the gospel now for five minutes if I had a time. That's what happens in the church when you get someone failing to operate with the church. Someone failing and pulling off and getting indifferent. That's a cancer in the church. It's a devil in that person. Right. And that causes the whole church to be sick over it. The best thing to do is have a spiritual operation. (laughs) Now, but in this, this little cell backslid and the cancer come in, the cancer then it lays there first, it's a, it's a spirit. Then it forms a teeny little cell of its own. And this little cell becomes its first, I couldn't call the big words for it, but the first form of life is the cancer. Painless. No one knows it's happening. And now this little cell is born, it must feed in order to feed, it has to feed on your bloodstream. 
Just like you fed on the bloodstream and when in the mother's womb you fed on the substance that she eat and so forth. So does this cancer feed on the substance of your body as one little cell. Then it grows, it's begin to feed. Another cell breaks out. Another cell breaks out. Another cell breaks out. That's why cell on cell, cell on cell, tumor, cataract, whatever it may be, grows bigger, 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 larger, spreading out, more cells, more cells. The first thing you know, begins to sap so much blood that this young lady begins to feel sick. Yes. See? What is it? It's also poison. It's death. It runs into every little uh, fiber of the body that it can, down in the tissues, stretching its legs down, weeding out like the roots of a tree, going all around, wrapping through the intestines, up through the spine. The doctor comes along, opens up, there's nothing can be done. The man, to the best of his knowledge, is saying everything he knows. There it is. Sew the patient back up, it's finished. It's all, there's nothing can be done. You can't take the person all apart. We couldn't find it all anyhow. There it is. The patient's hopelessly, helplessly, and gone then as far as the doctor's concerned. Now, here is divine healing. Oh, I'm past time. Now, wait a minute. I oughtn't to have said that. <laughs> Notice, let this soak in now real good. Here's the patient's coming. It comes moving up. Here stands the healer, as we call it in the terms, because I imagine we're all Christians here this afternoon. Here stands the one that's like the preacher, the healer, the prophet, whatever it may be. Here he stands. He's just a man. But here comes the Holy Ghost down and anoints this person. Yeah. Then he's not his own. He's, he's got a secret in his own heart that only him and God knows. Yeah. He submits himself yes. into the Spirit. Like a preacher going to the pulpit, submits himself. Yeah. He's got a text all here, oh, this is what I've got to preach on. But the first thing he knows, it don't work. A real Spirit-filled preacher will follow the Spirit every time. If he tries that old dry sermon, he'll make his congregation go to sleep. But if he goes ahead and follows the Spirit, God will lead him right out into deep waters with it. You know that's right. God's trying to get a message for it. Well, here's the man standing with healing now. He's anointed. Now, the first thing you know, here comes the patient walking up. Truly faith. Here stands the man anointed. As the patient begins to move up, the anointed man, not the man, now he's just human. But the spirit that's on him, Jesus said, not me, but my father that dwelleth in me. Here comes the patient walking up. Now the healer standing. He's watching the patient as he comes. His heart must be for the patient. He must love the patient. He must be willing to do anything to see that patient get well. His whole human soul has to go to that patient in divine love because he's knowing he's standing in the stead of the Lord Jesus Christ. And knowing at the day of judgment, he'll have to answer for every word. You must realize what you're doing. The patient walks up. The first thing you know, that cancer in that patient begins to move. What's the matter? It's recognizing, not that man, it's recognizing that spirit on the man. I've had them to come, when they'd be in straight jacks and holler, scream, they didn't even know their own name, say, William Branham, you've got nothing to do with me. And the people say... Why, they don't even know their own name. It wasn't them. It was that devil that had him so controlled like that that he knew what it was. You have nothing to do with me. Here they come up now. There you see your patient. It's moving up. What are you going to do? You're helpless. You turn to the audience. A critic spirit coming here. One coming from here. One coming from up here. You're anointed. You can feel it. Like Just like going... You can feel that. Then you can feel and know that this spirit here... If you watch your anointing, feel for the Holy Spirit, you hear another one over here crying. It's this one here, crying to that one there, for help to try to create an unbelief amongst the people. Anything that he can do. Here's an old demon-possessed person sitting there saying, now look, he's just reading their mind. If he can get that same spirit on the one next to him, the one next to him, the one next to him, they build up a chain. You see, Jesus, he took Peter, James, and John, he put the unbelievers outside. When Jesus went to heal a blind man, them standing around criticizing him, he took him by the hands, took him out of the city. Yeah. When Peter went in to raise dark, it says, all screaming and crying and going on, he took them everyone out. Yeah. That's right. Get to yourself. Here's the patient. But you're standing here like a public show almost. Oh, what will take place? What will be the decision of this woman standing here? I see 
you, then the first thing you know, the Spirit begins to know it. She's coming with good faith, coming believing with all of her heart. Here you are standing here the same way. Here's these demon powers and working all out through there, trying to get it. cooperation wherever it can. That's right. You say, hear me say sometimes, this woman here has certain, certain thing. That woman there has the same thing. That one over there has the same thing. That one over there has the same. It's every time the truth. Is that right? Yeah. What is it? It's that channel there. Yeah. Them demons screaming. Why, in a vision, you can almost see a dark street. That's right. And it's just, just as a pool. You can feel it. I don't know how to tell you you do it. But you do it. Now you're, what the thing is, you're trying to help the patient. Now here's the patient. What are you going to do? I say, oh my, now Lord, you said that if you'd be sincere and get the people to believe you, and when you prayed, nothing would stand before the prayer. I said, Lord, they won't believe me. He said, there will be given to you two Two gifts, like was given unto Moses. And you'll perform these things. And by this they will believe. The first thing about it, the main thing is not nothing. That don't have nothing to do with the healing of the people. He told me that I was born in this world to pray for sick people. And if I could get the people to believe me and be sincere when I prayed, nothing would stand before the prayer. That's what he told me. And it's the truth. That's right. It's not... See, this is not the healing. This is only to accumulate a faith to believe in healing. Amen. There's a patient standing there. Now I'm wondering what to do. I feel myself swaying and going. Looks like something's going from you. It's a battle going on. Here's the Holy Spirit standing here holding its ground. God's words right. There's men and women sitting there anointed with the devil, saying it's hypnotism, it's psychology, it's all this or that. It's wrong, it's wrong. Trying to anoint the rest of the crowd. And here's the Holy Spirit trying to get them to believe. Then let's gather as one unit. Yeah, That's right. Gather together and bind ourselves. Then when I feel that spirit settling up on the people, something's fixed to take place. I look around and think now, Holy Spirit, you told me that I know the secrets of their heart. And by this they would believe me. I say now, Lord, in my heart, let me know what this woman's done or what she, what's wrong with her. And the first thing you know, I break into another world. And I hear my voice, yet I don't know that I'm speaking, yet I'm talking to this woman, telling her what she done. She is at a doctor's office. She did a certain thing. He said she had cancer. When she's certain, certain done this, and where is she by? I see her come out of a house. I look up and I see the house number. I look at a street. Maybe I recognize a city or see a sign or, or something. She's got something in her hand or where she's kneeling, praying or something like that. Then the first thing you know, it fades from me. And when it does, I say, you believe? Is that the truth, sister? That's the truth. That's every bit the truth. Then I look back. I feel that battle still going on. Then what am I going to do? I don't know. I say, well, have faith in God. I pray and let him go on. Nine times out of ten, the life's still beating right there. But here comes another one just like her. The same thing's done. As soon as she walks there and that's revealed to her, brother, something happens down in here. Yeah. What happens? Then I feel that the Spirit is right. I say, Satan, come out of her. Yeah. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. The same God that spoke and brought life out of that tree, the same Holy Spirit speaking, bringing the life out of that cancer that's right. eating that woman up. Oh. Right? Yeah. She hurries off and she goes home telling people, oh, God, heal me. Her husband said, Nah, now nah, you're getting all worked up. She goes and tells her self-styled pastor, While well, that days of miracles is past. Go ask your doctor. Doctor, why the girl's still there. Don't you believe that holy roller? Well, sure, the tree was still standing there. But the life was out of it. Hallelujah. Let her go on. Saying, Yes, I believe it. I don't care how many times my husband says, no, if there's a growth that big around, I still, something in my heart told me I'm healed. Yeah. Sometimes a vision will break forth. I'll see her years later. I'll say, thus saith the Lord. Yeah. Brother, watch that then. <laughs> it's already happened. Thus saith the Lord. You are healed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to be well. There ain't enough devils out of hell can break it then. Yeah. That's right. That woman will go home. She'll feel good for a few days. The life's gone out. There's the cancer still there. She'll feel good for a few days and she'll go on rejoicing. The first thing you know, that corruption, the wither begins from the root. What was it? That tiny little germ, it went in there first to cause that cancer. That life has gone out. Amen. Yes. Casting out devils. Lord. 
Hallelujah. That devil is gone. And when it's gone, the believer believes it. And it wasn't my faith. It was the operation of the Holy Ghost through me that gave her faith. Her own faith is what made her well. Then she's healed. There she goes about. And no matter how sick she gets, she still believes that there's nothing that can change her. She's solid. She believes it with all of her heart. She's bound to get sick. That old thing begins to swell. First thing you know, it gets worse. She gets sick. She gets a fever. She gets down. Sure, it's dying, rotten, and right away. <laughs> the patient gets well. Sometimes there's a miracle performed. It just vanishes away. But what is it? Casting out devils. Yeah. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, not only this tree, but if you say to that mountain, be removed and don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you said will come to pass. Amen. Yes. Oh, glory. Praise God. Oh, my. I like these afternoon meetings when we just get together like this. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, in my name, they shall cast out devils. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what he said. That's what I believe. That's thus saith the Lord. In my name, they shall cast out devils. And they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. There's a devil exposed. Your cancer with a little pet name called cancer, he's a devil. That little old fever's been bothering you. It's the devil. That's yes, right. indeedy. It used to be a long time ago when prohibition's in. They had the old whiskey jug called John Barleycorn with a great big old straw hat on it and a big funny looking eyes. And here's a horrible looking thing. You know what? They took old John Barleycorn down and they put him in little tin bumpers and little cans. People set them all in their ice box, all polished up and in society. But brother, at the bottom of it is still the same old damnable rotten liquor drink that ever was the first place. He's still the same. Yeah. If he's in bumpers or whatever he's in, yeah. it's still the same old devil. And you might call him in this other medical room, you might call it cancer, you might call it tumor, cataract or fungus or whatever you want to. But it's still the same old devil that Jesus said, come out of the man. Yeah. Oh. Hallelujah. I'm the Lord thy God. That forgiveth all of thine iniquities, who healeth all of thy diseases. Do you believe it? Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee this afternoon for the gathering. As the Word has been all chopped up, Lord, but may the Holy Spirit some way divide it out straightly and give it to every heart. May when these people come to this meeting tonight, may they come with such a stern determination that nothing's going to bother them no more. Lord. May faith be instilled in their heart till the devils of hell can't shake them no way. And may this be a time of revival and moving Hallelujah. among the people. Lord, may the lame walk, the blind see, the cancers be healed, devils cast out. May this week produce such a revival in Amen. Chicago. Will long remembered and make this meeting so salty. Uh, you said you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt has only got a look and not a savior, it is henceforth good for nothing but to be laughed at. And Father, we pray that every Christian will take his post of duty, get on the telephone, call others, do everything he can, go out into the country, dragging from the hedges and highways and byways, the lame, halt, blind, which was the last call that Jesus said would be before the coming, the great supper. Grant it, Father, and we'll praise thee in eternity when the battle's all over, the hot sun is finished. And we sit down under the shade of the evergreen yes, tree. Lord. There to rest when the old war, the implements of war is stacked together. Yes. The last sermons preached, the devil's defeated and chained up and sent into Lord. hell. Hallelujah. All the demons are bound. Hallelujah. Yes. No more cancer, no more Amen. diseases. Everything Lord. is whipped out in Christ Lord. is king and God is back. Hallelujah. And the saints live and reign with him forever. Till then, may the Holy Ghost guide the church and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you and I'll see you.